Hey everybody, hi, welcome. Hopefully you're having a great time and enjoying day two of Start Dev Change, learning lots about the Power Platform today. Uh, my name is Tasha Scott and I am a business program manager here at Microsoft. Uh, I have the great joy and fortune of building Power Apps and Power Automate flows every day as part of my day job as a citizen developer. Uh, and that was never my plan. If you had told me, um, you know, when I was right out of college that one day I would work for Microsoft, I would never have believed you. It was never my intention to have a tech career. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how you too can also have a tech career um, if that's what you're interested in and what it looks like to be a citizen developer inside Microsoft. Um, we have a lot to cover today in a pretty short period of time, so please feel free to leave your questions in the chat and I'll hang out in the chat uh, for a while a little bit afterwards. And you can always find me on Twitter um, at Tasha's Ev. I'm frequently there uh, with a Red Bull on my head. So let's get started. All right. Um, we're going to talk about who am I and how I got this this crazy tech career um, without even without that being the plan. Um, and so we're going to go over a quick history of myself and my background. Uh, we're going to look at what it means to be a citizen developer and what that looks like here inside Microsoft. And then finally, I'm going to give you some resources so that if that's something that you're interested in pursuing, you can get started right away. Part one of this is uh, who am I? How am I here? Why is any of this important to you? Why do you care? Why am I here talking to you at Start Dev Change? And that's because um, there's this sort of mythology around having a career in tech. Uh, a lot of times when you think about what it looks like to have a career in tech or what, what a developer looks like, um, you have this picture in your head and it probably involves hoodies and maybe it involves like starting coding when you were two before you could even walk. And there's a word for that, it's called archetype. And when you have this archetype of what it looks like to be a developer or what it looks like to have a career in tech and maybe you feel like you don't match that picture, um, it might be harder to picture yourself there. And I'm here to tell you that that's not true. Um, I am definitely exhibit A of a person who doesn't fit that archetype. Uh, I, I don't really care for hoodies. I know that loses me a lot of nerd cred uh, and uh, th but that's okay. You don't have to fit that archetype to have a career in tech. Uh, I come from a lower class family. We have uh, enlisted military roots. I moved around a ton as a kid and we didn't have uh, my first computer in my household until I was 15 years old. A lot of nerds like can tell you about their Commodore 64 or whatever they had when they were small and that's that's definitely not me. I could not tell you what kind of computer it was. I know it had a monochromatic screen and uh, and then my stepdad broke it like two months after after we got it. So I didn't get my first real experiences with computers um, until college and that by itself was kind of a miracle. I'm the first woman in my family to graduate from high school. Uh, I'm still the only person in my family to have gone to college and gotten uh, a degree and that degree is in English which you'll hear all the time about how English is one of those useless degrees that you know doesn't actually like give you the opportunity to have a career um, and that's completely completely not true. Um, when I first started out right after college, what did I do with that degree in English? Uh, I went to work at a newspaper and uh, it's a, a, my local newspaper, but a little bit bigger. It's the Virginian Pilot for anybody familiar with the Hampton Roads area of Virginia. And I was a page layout girl, which still didn't use my, my English degree. Um, but what it did bring into my life at that point in time was SharePoint. And this was probably about 12 years ago now. And even then, the newspaper I worked at was using SharePoint for business process automation. And that's really where my tech career journey began. Uh, I thought that a lot of the things that we were automating was was really neat. So I went to ask the person who built those business process automations like, hey, can you show me how that works? And uh, she did. And it was it was awesome. And I was like, this is pretty cool. I, I think I, I would like to learn how to do this. 
And so she showed me how to do a few things. And when uh, when her she moved on to a different role, I took her job as, as the SharePoint girl at my newspaper. And that brought me to another key critical uh, moment in my tech career journey. I joined my first user group. It was the Hampton Roads SQL Server and SharePoint user group. And I was there every month and I learned a ton for free. And uh, because I was there every month, I ended up helping to run that user group. And that led me to the next step in my tech career journey. Um, because I was there all the time and sort of uh, established myself as a person who was you know, pretty good at this whole SharePoint thing, uh, I was offered my first tech consulting job. I became a SharePoint consultant. And that was a huge risk because I had no idea what it meant to be a consultant. Um, I certainly wasn't like that wasn't a thing that I was trying to do, but that's where I landed. And it was a good timing because as you can as you can see, like this was the height of the recession, sort of like 2009 time frame, 2008, 2009. And then from that point, I, I took another big risk. I moved to Washington, D.C. and um, became a senior SharePoint consultant through that um, through that part of my journey. And again, like I, I had no idea that, that that's where I was gonna go. And taking on successively more challenging uh, consulting jobs led me here to Microsoft. So why is any of that important to you? I really understand, I really get it. Like this slide is so cheesy, it really is. Um, but I totally believe this. this. If I can get a tech career, so can you. Absolutely. And even I'm kind of like exhibit A of even if you're not trying to a obtain a tech career, you can sort of accidentally fall into one through being a citizen developer. And being a citizen developer is an awesome, awesome on ramp into starting your tech career. Which leads us to part two of this presentation. Uh, what is a citizen developer? You've probably heard that a lot today. Um, maybe it's the first time that you've ever heard that phrase before. Maybe not. Maybe you're well familiar with it. Um, but at the end of the day, a citizen developer is somebody who builds business process solutions and applications for other people using tools sanctioned by their corporate IT or central IT organization. And I'm hoping that this diagram helps a little bit. You can see citizen developers over here. And maybe you've seen some of these other terms as well, things like end user, things like power user. And you can see that all of this is on a gradient. And that's really important because as you start out and you have these tools, maybe you recognize some of these icons here for things that you use at school or things that you use in your current job. As you get more well versed with these tools and you grow your skill set, you start to get into these sort of like blurry lines and then you continue to get new tools. Your tool set gets bigger and you try new things and you move down this gradient. Today, I'm probably about here on the um, on this gradient in my uh, Microsoft job. But there's been times in my career where I've definitely landed more over here in this traditional developer space. Um, how did I learn all this? especially in such a short period of time you know like when I when I started this uh, when I started this journey and I, I really have to point out this this is important this is a perfectly valid and uh, possible pathway into a tech career I'm going to like pause what I was just saying because this this part is really important um, you may have this idea that you need a computer science degree or maybe you need to go to a coding boot camp in order to have a, a tech career. And, you know, Charles said it in his keynote a little bit ago. You really don't. Um, starting off as an end user, growing your skill set and getting more knowledgeable as you go is an absolutely valid and well-worn path into a tech career. This is what my pathway into uh, where I am today looked like, uh, starting here as a as a lowly SharePoint um, person at the newspaper in my page layout um, page layout department, just building out SharePoint pages and lists and um, taking these things called web parts and sort of their like pre built uh, controls and putting it onto a page. And then, you know, as I grew all the way over here to to um, writing C sharp code in full trust info path solutions, this is quite the progression. 
Um, basically, I started out using just like a GUI interface, uh, dragging and dropping those web parts onto a page. And then I had to do some business process automation. So um, I had to learn SharePoint designer workflows. And then I needed to do some data visualization. So I had to learn how to write something called XSLT, which is Extensible Style Sheet Language Transformations. That's how we did data view web parts back in the day. Uh, and thankfully, we are we are not we're not doing those anymore. <laughs> Uh, but then to do some of the cool and hip things on SharePoint pages, uh, I had to learn JavaScript. And we use something called uh, an SSP services, which is a JavaScript library on top of jQuery that was just for uh, customizing SharePoint pages. And then later in my journey, um, when I became a more senior consultant, uh, I had to do things like SharePoint administration tasks. So I had to learn PowerShell. And that finally led me to, to the place I was right before I joined Microsoft, where I had to learn C Sharp, which is a type of .NET. Um, and so, you know, I had, to, I had to learn that as well. And that brings me back to what I was saying before. How did I learn all this? Um, and you've heard it a bunch of times, and it really is, if the only thing that you take away from this conference is the importance of tech community, I really want that to be the thing. Whatever it is that you're trying to learn, go join that community. If you're trying to learn Go, you want to learn Ruby, you want to learn .NET, you want to learn Power Apps, there's a community out there for you. And being an active and present member of that community is absolutely the fastest way that you can on-ramp into whatever tech it is that you're trying to learn. Now, this journey would look different today. Uh, what's important about what I just showed you is pretty much most the vast majority of that stuff uh, it doesn't exist anymore, which is great. That's actually one of the really great things about having a tech career is that there's always new tools. There's always something new to learn. And whenever a new tool comes out, it sort of like is like a mini reset button. Everybody has to start uh, from ground zero. Everyone has to start um, from scratch to learn. So and but that community aspect of it really never changes, right? The community is always there even when the tools change. So even though we don't have SharePoint designer workflows anymore, we do that business process automation now using Power Automate. And whereas before I was doing complex data visualizations using data view web parts, now we have Power BI for that. And in the place where I would have written uh, C Sharp, you know, full trust info path solutions, again, like we've we've evolved, right? So now we we build power apps and you can make really incredible applications using the power apps expression language. Or if you want to get really fancy when you're really down your, your tech journey path, you can build power apps component framework components using TypeScript or JavaScript. And one of the things that Donna and Seth said earlier about all of this also is really true. Um, you know, I want to reiterate, this is a super valid career path. And this space here, uh, they did a LinkedIn search earlier in the conference where uh, I think there was like 1200 entries for Power Apps jobs. That's this space right here. Um, I've been doing this for 12 years now and I've never had a shortage of work. So now we've caught up to today and what I do uh, at Microsoft. What does is, what is being a citizen developer at Microsoft mean? Uh, when I introduced myself, I said that my title is business program manager. And what that means is I'm embedded in the business. I work for a part of Microsoft called GSMO or the Global Sales and Marketing Organization as part of an operations team. And my team uh, builds enterprise grade applications and automations for our field sellers. Um, it, they're a worldwide group of people. We've got about 33,000 folks that we build solutions for. Um, and we really push the limits of what it means to build Power Apps and to build Power Automate flows. Um, the other thing that I do as part of my role at Microsoft is, you know, that, that community of Power Platform users, they build their own Power Apps. And so I'm responsible for helping to nurture that community and give them a safe place to play and uh, help them build their own Power Apps so that when our customers ask them, hey, how does Microsoft use Power Apps? Um, they have something they can show them and they have a good story to tell. So nurturing the, our internal community for the Power Platform is a part of my role as well. 
And along both of those journeys, both like pushing the, the power platform, power apps and power automate uh, to its limits and building that community, uh, my team works incredibly closely with the product group. Um, we, we share our successes, we share our challenges, and uh, when we get a wish list, uh, we share the wish list with the product group. So at the end of the day, all of the work that we do in the Power Platform translates into a better product for you. And I wanna show you a little bit about what that looks like. So we're gonna go ahead and go to demo time. And I'm gonna start here. Um, this, is, this, is not, uh, this is not something that, that my team uses, but I wanna start here because if you've had the uh, fortune to be in the conference all day today, you, you've seen Power Apps in action a couple of times, but if you're just joining now, I wanna show you what something simple looks like so that you can sort of see the progression. And when you're first starting out at make.powerapps.com and you go to create an app, you can see that there's a bunch of templates down here. And this is a really great place to start when you're first learning Power Apps. Just fire up some of these templates and sort of poke around in them. Um, and you can learn a ton about how Power Apps works really, really quickly. This is a sample app that I built called Research Buddy. Um, it's a really simple mobile application that is for saving URLs while you're doing research. And it's not complicated, but it solves a really common problem. And it was really simple and easy to build. And solving small problems with apps like this is really a great first step towards learning the Power Platform. And you can see each of these screens here, there's four of them. And in these screens, there's just a handful of controls. And if I click on one of these, we've got like a little bit of business logic in here. I'll click on color. And you can see there's a really simple formula in here. And again, this is how you go down that gradient is by learning these kinds of conventions and doing really simple things first. Now, when you get to uh, building things like my team builds, it gets a little more complex. So what you're looking at here is the account planning tool. This is the flagship app that my team uh, has offered to our account executives to build out their account plans in, in cooperation and partnership with our customers throughout the year. And one of the things that you can see here is there's a lot of screens in this app. And these screens are doing really complex things. Like um, whenever we work in partnership with a customer, we are making sure that those partnership uh, objectives that we have align directly with things that the customer wants to achieve um, throughout the year. And so we don't, we don't have any partnership opportunities that aren't like actually aligned to um, the customer's things that they want to achieve for the year. Um, to do that, we do a ton of research. So if I click on one of these research screens here, it's a little slow because I am sharing. Come on, pup. It's a little slow. There we go. So we do, um, we do a ton of research. We do research for the industry that the customer is in. We do um, our own research on the customer itself. It's usually not this slow, I promise. <laughs> Whenever I share my screen, it's always really slow. There we go. So um, we do a bunch of research on the customer and then once we're done putting all this together, um, at the end of it, we have this button here, which actually exports all of that into a pre-formatted Word document. We'll, look, we'll take more look at that in a moment. Um, I wanna show you what that looks like behind the scenes. Uh, this is the edit version of an older, older one. This is a V2 of the account planning tool. And I want you to see here, remember how Research Buddy had four screens? Uh, the account planning tool probably has about 30 screens in it. And if I expand one of these out, I think it's, uh, some of these have a ridiculous quantity of controls, just really, Literally, there's literally thousands of controls in this Power App, um, and that's what I mean when I say we push um, we push the limits of what it means to build Power Apps and build really robust enterprise grade applications using the platform. Uh, this app is now considered a mission critical app for our field se field sellers, and um, you know we have people around the world, a, a large number of people around the world, who rely on this tool to be able to. Um, 
execute their objectives with their customers for the year. So I mentioned that export button, that little like print button right here. Um, and I wanna talk about Power Automate now because my team doesn't only build Power Apps, we also build Power Automate flows. And again, I wanna follow the same sort of pattern that we did with Research Buddy. This is a very, very simple Power Automate flow. This is one of the templates. And again, if you're just learning Power Apps or Power Automate, go check out those templates. You can learn so much just from cracking them open, seeing uh, the way that the steps are laid out. And this particular one, again, it's really small. There's only four pieces here, really. And um, it's solving a, a good, solid business problem. The idea here is that if somebody submits a form, we get the details for that form, we create a task in Planner, and then we post about it to Teams. Again, super simple, super discreet, but it saves you a ton of time if you're the person who would have had to like enter this stuff manually into a spreadsheet and then type up an email and send it to somebody. We don't want people doing that stuff. Let's automate all of those things. And this is a simple version of that. Now, I'm gonna show you what that Power Automate flow on that one button, that export button in the account planning tool does. And I am gonna to have to zoom out to show you that. I'm gonna to have to zoom out a lot. There we go, it's still going. Okay, now you can see all, all of it, almost all of it. You can't even see all of it, it's so tiny. <laughs> When you start to build enterprise grade uh, power automates, they get to be really big like this and really complex. And so when you're starting to get on that far right side of the citizen developer, traditional developer gradient, this is what building in power automate looks like. And this isn't even fully expanded out. If you look, a lot of these uh, conditional logic are nested in here. And I'm sure I could spend some time showing you exactly how giant this power automate flow gets. Um, but what this does is after our account executive goes and fills out all of the details in all of those screens that I was showing you earlier, instead of having to write their own Word version of that plan and retyping things that they've already typed before, we do all that work for them. So we chunk through all of the data in that account plan. We do some uh, conditional logic and put additional things in there. And then once it all is said and done, we cram it into this uh, Word template where um, it's pre-formatted, it's really pretty, it's business ready, and then we email it to the account executive. And usually those account plans end up being like, I think the average is like 30 to 50 pages. Imagine the time savings there, somebody not having to create that document. Um, it's incredible. And that means that our field sellers get to spend more time out in the field with our customers than spending time writing these Word documents. And that's the idea, that's the business problem that, that we're solving here with this Power Automate flow. Um, if you're interested, there is a blog post that goes into more detail about the business problem that, this, uh, that the account planning tool solves and um, the uh, sort of little bit deeper dive into the implementation. And I will actually go back so that you can get the URL for that. Here's the URL for that blog post, if that's something that you wanna go and check out. Um, and that can be sort of something that maybe gets you inspired because you know, when you think about being a citizen developer, a lot of times you don't know how far you can take that road. And that this is a great example of how far you can take that road. All right, hopefully that was inspiring to you. And maybe now you wanna get started on your own citizen developer journey or even your own traditional developer journey. And I have very good news for you. You've already gotten started by being here in this conference today. Being here at Start Dev Change is really the start part of Start Dev Change. It means that you're at least thinking that maybe this is something you might like to do. And I wanna encourage you to do that because the reality is, is that being, doing developer type work, the tools are really not the important part. The tools are always going to change. Um, the thing that is important is solving problems and how you solve problems and how you think about problems. And that's really how you can start that path to becoming a great developer is just thinking about how you think about solving problems. Um, 
you know, challenge the places where you don't understand why we're doing something this way. Ask that question, ask a dumb question, say, you know, why do we do it this way? And if the answer is, uh, this is the way we've always done it, then that's an indication to you that it's time to revisit that and maybe think about doing it in a more modern way. A lot of times that means automating business processes. And so anytime you see something where people get approval by sending an email to one person and they email another person, or maybe you're tracking stuff in an Excel spreadsheet or Google Sheets, um, those are prime candidates for automation. And do that, take on that work, make that one of your starter projects. Uh, any small thing that you can automate times each person that does it is a huge time savings, even if it doesn't seem like it from, from the get-go. And then think about how you solve problems. Um, don't ever try to solve an entire problem at one time. Break it down into smaller chunks. And if you get stuck, especially, um, break it down into even smaller chunks and try to solve that tiny snack size problem before trying to solve the whole problem. And as you go through and you solve each one of those problems, then eventually you'll get to the end and you ha will have solved the entire thing. If you're excited to learn more about Power Apps, uh, I encourage you to go get an account. Um, Charles mentioned earlier a couple ways that you can get an account. You can get a community plan account, or if you're a student, you can join the Student Ambassador Program. Um, and there's a lot of great stuff on Microsoft Learn for you to get started learning Power Apps. This link here is actually towards um, uh, like all of the Power Apps uh, learning modules. And this link here is for, uh, we have a really great videos and tutorials page um, on the, the Power Apps page. Um, and then once you've gotten a little bit ramped up, you wanna try something a little more uh, involved, uh, go check out this blog post. This will walk you through using those templates and getting started with templates. And I really, really, really love the Power Apps Community App Sample Gallery. Um, these are all community shared apps. Um, go check it out. There's really neat stuff there like video games. People actually build video games using Power Apps um, and they just share it there. So you can download them. You can have a look at how they were built and that'll teach you a lot about some really interesting things and interesting ways that you can solve problems using, using Power Apps. And I know you've heard the word community a lot today, and it's really so important to your tech career. I just, I really can't emphasize that enough. If Power Apps is something, or Power Automate, Power Platform is something that you're interested in, uh, go join a user group. Right now, a lot of them are virtual, so you have the opportunity to attend even ones that maybe you wouldn't be able to attend because, I don't know, they're in Vienna or something. Um, and now, because they're virtual, you can just, you know, hang out in your living room and attend a user group, it's pretty awesome. I also want to recommend the Humans of IT um, site for uh, mentoring opportunities, get you a tech career mentor, and this is a great place to make that happen. And if you're not on Twitter already, I really recommend uh, going and joining Twitter. Um, there's a really wonderful and vibrant Power Platform community there. You can find it with either hashtag Power Addicts, or um, if you are wanting to learn like you know, uh, coding language, I can't recommend Code Newbies highly enough. It's really awesome, welcoming community for people who are just getting started on their, on their coding journey. Um, this particular learn link is for the Power Apps Fundamentals Learning Path. So um, this is definitely step one on your journey to learning Power Apps. And that's it. I was really excited to share all of this with you today. I hope you found it to be inspirational and I will head over to the chat to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Well, Tasha, as always is amazing. And I, you know, I've never asked her how she got, like why she wears the red bowl on her head on Twitter. Cause why not? No, but there's got to be like a cool story, yeah, that's right? that's the answer. Because really cool. why not? She's super cool. She'll wear it at real conferences too. Like Ignite. It's how you find Tasha is look for the woman with the bowl on her head at the meetup. There's Tasha. And I've known her for years. She's so nice. Yeah. That, that, was, that was an excellent, excellent uh, demo there. 